Good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's STS 133 post flight readiness review. Uh, with us today to talk about the, uh, the meeting are NASA's Associate Administrator for Space Operations, Mr. Bill Gerstenmeyer. Good afternoon. Space Shuttle Program Launch Integration Manager, Mike Moses. Good afternoon. And Shuttle Launch Director, Mike Leinbach. Good afternoon. We'll start things off with opening comments and then we'll be happy to take your questions. Mr. Gerstenmeyer. Thanks, Mike. Uh, again, we had a very thorough review today. We went through um, all the systems that, that are getting ready to go fly here on this uh, STS-133. Uh, we looked back at the uh, previous flows and looked at all the anomalies to make sure that they'd all been uh, thoroughly resolved. Uh, we looked at the problems that have occurred during this flow and, and it's really been pretty minor from the, the previous uh, problems and then also the flow's been pretty smooth the entire time. We spent a little bit of time talking about the, the new systems that are going up to space station, the permanent MPLM which will add some nice stowage capability to the station and also some research capability. Uh, we talked quite a bit about the ISS systems on orbit, uh, the oxygen generation system, the carbon dioxide removal system, the new Sabatier system, which was just recently activated on orbit, uh, and those systems and how they affect the ability to support uh, the contingency crew if they need to stay on board station. Uh, we took a look at the EVAs that are planned for the mission, and if you take a look at the video, you'll see that the EVAs are pretty complicated. The, the crews are really pretty much all over the outside of space station in various locations. Um, they're, the teams are well prepared to, to pick up the EVA tasks. It includes uh, venting the, uh, the ammonia pump and then preparing that ammonia pump for eventual return uh, on another flight. Um, I think another thing that we got from the review is that the program's still improving. Um, you'll see that there's a new uh, hydraulic power unit fuel pump. That's the uh, pump that provides the uh, hydraulic uh, fluid to the, uh, to the uh, tilt and, uh, and rock actuators and the SRBs. There's a new design of that pump that prevents metal-to-metal -metal contact and, and removes a critical one failure from that pump. There's still some of the older style pumps on, but then the next flight will have all new style pumps. So it's good that we're removing some critical failures out of the system. I think that's a very good thing to do. We continued to put on tougher tile. There's about 33 new tile that are the tougher Brie tile on the bottom of the orbiter, and the teams have done that. We lose periodically some putty repairs that come off of the old tile. We've again repaired uh, many locations of that on the orbiter. Uh, we're continuing to do some things for the future. We're increasing the bump height of the boundary layer DTO to half an inch from 0.35 inches. That'll cause that uh, boundary layer to trip now at Mach, uh, I think, 19 and a half, which will give us some very critical data that'll help us understand what happens in the high Mach number regions for reentry spacecraft and what a, a, a turbulent boundary layer means to heat transfer in those regions, which have lots of applications to future spacecraft. We're also flying the Dragon Eye for the SpaceX commercial guys on this flight. That'll help them with the rendezvous prox op sensor. We've flown it before. This will be the second flight of that, which will help them eventually when they come to station. So I think the message here is we're still improving. We're still looking for ways to do inventive and creative things to keep the shuttle flying safe. Um, I'd also like to congratulate the team for doing great work on the cross-feed flange work. Michael talked to you about that a little bit more. And then finally, we set the launch date uh, for November 1st, and uh, we see pretty much normal flow between now and November 1st. So again, a very thorough review. The teams are very focused on what they need to do. We've looked at ways to continue to keep improving, to keep looking for things that might be, that might be early indications of problems, and we're looking at ways to continue to improve the system. So it was a very good review, and it was a good chance to get together with the team and review their work. Thanks. Yeah, I, I can't say much more other than, than what Bill kind of said. It's a huge testament to the, uh, to the teams doing the work in, in what's uh, a very tough time, both with all the uncertainties in the, uh, in the future and then the current layoffs that are happening within the shuttle program as we wind down. But uh, the bottom line is, is not only is the hardware in really good shape, as we heard today, um, but, but my personal impression of watching everybody work through these problems is that the, the, the team is in very good shape as well um, from an uh, execution level. You know, you never hope for problems, and I, and I probably wouldn't have picked this as the problem to hope for, but the, the fuel flange leak that we had really kind of demonstrated that interaction between the JSC team, the KSC team, uh, the technicians, the engineering analysis, the schedule folks. Um, everybody did an amazingly good job of working through that issue, uh, identifying the problem, deciding what options we had to go forward, picking a path, and then executing in a, in a fantastic fashion. Um, and again, I'll let um, Mike Leinbach talk to you about some of the details of that repair work, but, but it concluded and everything's in great shape uh, with that fuel leak. 
But again, it reflects on the, the team's readiness to execute. We kind of had a summer off a little bit uh, without a flight, and, uh, and they're all still in just tip-top shape, ready to go just like they were last spring. So no worries about the, the team. Um, as Bill said, the, the review went really well. We got a unanimous go for launch uh, on the first. The, uh, the things that I took away were, were kind of we're still paying attention to the details. Um, for example, on the, the external tank, we've been doing a, a new welding technique for a while now called friction stir welding. Um, we finally had a, an area that had a, a little bit of a defect that was picked up in post-welding uh, NDE, which is non-destructive evaluation. That got evaluated, cleared through the normal boards. But uh, just to give it some extra thoroughness, they took it to the, the Marshall Space Flight Center's uh, material review board. They went through there. They went to their senior management review board at Marshall. They brought it to the shuttle program, and we brought it again here today at the agency FRR just for folks to see the thoroughness that went into that analysis on that, that new technique just to make sure no one had any questions about the, uh, the repair. And actually, it turns out it wasn't so much a repair as a use-as-is with that little bit of defect that, uh, that was in one of the welds on the external tank. Another good example is uh, learning from other programs. The Ares program test fired a DM2 motor, which is a demonstration motor number two. It was a five-segment SRB. That was a couple months ago out in Utah. In the post-flight analysis of that, they discovered a little area of uh, erosion on the nozzle that's a little bit unusual. Hadn't been seen before. Nothing, nothing serious, but just a little different than those engineers had seen. So they called in the shuttle team to take a look to see if there was any analogies to the to the nozzle and the motors we fly. And and our our team of engineers took a look at it as well. And and the thing that I take away is um, they're still trying to do their troubleshooting and determine what caused that. Um, it, it looks like it might be something that's test-induced, but it's too early to tell. But because the DM Aries team does not yet have a good physics-based understanding of how that failure occurred, that, that's one of the things we look for when we have flight rationale is do we f understand the problem and does it make sense from a fundamental physics standpoint um, and that you're not just kind of creating a solution that makes it sound like it fixes your problem. Does it truly hold water uh, when you step back and look at it? And because they haven't gotten that far, uh, the shuttle team took a look to say, well, without that, what can we do to beef up our rationale? It's a different material. It's a different weave. It's actually a different contour in the nozzle. There are significant differences. Uh, and ultimately, we back that up with flight test. One of the reasons we do these static motor firings, in addition to the reason Ares is doing them together pre-flight test data, we do them in the shuttle program to kind of bracket um, changes in the motors or casting segments. So we actually have uh, a, flight, uh, a, a static test fire motor that we did FSM-17 a couple months ago now, almost a year ago, I think. Um, which actually was a nozzle that was cast after this. And so it kind of, the nozzles we're flying right now on the shuttle through the end of the program have kind of been bracketed by this test that we did a while back to say that we kind of can say previous flight performance, we already kind of know what the next flight performance is thanks to this test motor. We're in really good shape on the shuttle program and, uh, and we don't see any problems there. Ultimately, if a problem like that did show up, it's not a safety of flight concern at all. It's just kind of a, uh, an unusual erosion that takes away a little bit of the margins, but uh, no real problem at all. But again, a good demonstration of the level of detail that the team is still going into. You know, uh, end of the program here, we could have just kind of sloughed that off and said that's close enough. We don't need to worry about it, but we were certainly not going to sit back and relax. Um, Bill talked to you about some of the safety mods we're doing with the, uh, the fuel pump that we put into the SRBs. Um, we're advancing uh, research still with flying the SpaceX uh, nav sensor for rendezvous, flying the new boundary layer DTO height in the flame trench. We did some mods, added some sensors to help characterize the true environment in the flame trench, and we're testing some new materials, uh, ablative materials down there in the flame trench to help follow on programs. Uh, and then the challenges that we overcome, like with that, uh, with the fuel flange leak that we had. Um, the other thing I know you guys are going to ask, so I'll jump to it. Uh, last flight of discovery, just to give you some of the facts and figures. Um, you know, it started construction back in August of 1979 and, and first flew in 1984, STS-41D. Quite a, quite a remarkable history for Discovery. It's had a whole bunch of firsts. Um, it, it carried Hubble into orbit. It, uh, it was our return to flight vehicle following both Challenger and Columbia. Um, and so it kind of it was the pathfinder as we, we put new, new systems in place, new safety features. Um, at the end of, uh, at the end of its, its life here, uh, it'll have traveled over about 150 million miles. And, and the more impressive stat that I saw today was um, the number of days it'll be in space will be just about a year. So it'll, it'll have been in space for about a year total time in orbit, which is pretty impressive. Um, that's talking about the past with Discovery. And again, we try not to focus too much on that. So 
talking about the here and now with Discovery is the STS-133 mission in front of us, and it's it's a very challenging one. The PMM going up, the, the permanent uh, multipurpose logistics module, carrying up a whole lot of cargo. We're not going to spend a lot of time unloading it like we normally do. If this was an MPLM resupply flight, you'd see us install that MPLM and then spend a lot of dock days unpacking it and then packing all the, the return stuff to bring back into the cargo bay. Because this one's staying behind, we don't have to be so aggressive on our schedules to unpack everything out of the out of the, the PMM because it is going to stay on orbit. So that the time's a little little different in the timeline. The crew has a little more time to, to spend on experiments and, and EVA work. But inside the PMM, uh, you probably know some of the big things. Uh, the Robonauts in there, um, we're carrying up in another express rack. I think it's the eighth express rack, which is basically a, a pre-packed set of stuff that allows for easy experimentation on the station, kind of plug-and-play uh, experimentation. One of the cool ones that I, I picked off the list was a uh, a boiling experiment uh, that basically is going to be a rack to look at at how fluids uh, interact and boil in space. We do a lot of things with, with combustion. I think this is the first time we're going to focus in on on the act of boiling in a, in a microgravity environment. Um, and then there's a lot of, uh, we call it sortie science, which is science that goes up, gets activated, and we can re-return it on the shuttle mid-deck. Uh, the Japanese uh, Space Agency, the European Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency uh, all have payloads that were either taken up and executing or returning back from station. And so it's a pretty good thing from, from that standpoint for a science mission. We're taking up spares with the ELC, the cargo carrier, has a spare radiator panel on it uh, that'll go up in case the station needs a spare. That's a pretty massive ORU, which is an orbital replacement unit, basically a big part. Um, and the shuttle's one of the only things that can carry that up, so it'll be good to have that spare on orbit. Um, and, uh, and then on the return side, again, highlighting that the shuttle return payload capabilities is, is a pretty important thing. The uh, oxygen generation uh, unit on station has had a couple hiccups, uh, and they ended up replacing what they call the hydrogen dome, which is basically the reactor that uh, where they where they basically combine to to, uh, to 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 take the water, break it down into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, we're going to fly that back. It's a pretty big, massive piece of metal. If you think about it, it's called a containment dome for a reason. It's there in case there's a, a problem with the hydrogen and the oxygen and you had a little detonation. This thing is made to contain that, that de low-level detonation. So we're going to return it on the mid-deck of the shuttle. We had to do some analysis to make sure it was safe to return in, a, in an off-nominal stowage configuration, and it's good to go. So that's, that's a good use for Discovery to be bringing that piece back and allow the failure investigation to continue. Um, we heard today, and I'm sure Bill will agree too, the uh, the ECLIS, the, which we call the ECLIS systems, which are the environmental life support systems on the station, are really one of the true unsung pathfinders for what we're going to do in the future. If we're going to go out to Mars, uh, having a life support system that's contained is, is vital. And uh, and we have one on station, and it's working, but we're still learning, and we're still in its infancy, um, and, and we're really taking advantage of the fact that we can service it, we can tweak it, we can upgrade it, we can bring samples home and analyze them. But as we go forward from here, we're going to need to do that without those crutches. And so the, the more we can take advantage of the station systems, uh, the better. We, we talk a lot about the science and the payloads that station does, just the systems and the act of building and, and operating station is a great learning tool as well uh, as we go forward for exploration. So I think I've talked enough. Um, basically, the last thing I had was uh, on the range, in case you guys ask, uh, right now the range is clear. We have launch opportunities from the first all the way through the seventh if we need them. Um, we're going to have to stop and, and top off some, some cryos if we needed to, but, uh, but it'll play out that we basically have a couple of days here to launch. Uh, we'd like to get off in this November window because... Uh, uh, due to other things like beta cutouts and solar angles and, and other visiting vehicles, uh, it's a pretty busy traffic model. In fact, uh, the, the, uh, the 40P progress just, I'm sorry, the 37P progress just undocked today. 40P launches on Wednesday, it docks on Saturday. Coming up at the end of the year, there's an ATV from ESA, there's an HTV from Japan, there's a couple more progresses, another Soyuz. It gets pretty crowded up there in space, so we'd like to get off in this window if we can, and, and we have a really good shot at it. I think Mike will have plenty of chances. <laughs> so that's it. Okay. Good. Let me start out by uh, giving an overview of the processing of the pad, and, uh, and then I'll go into the leak repair a little bit in, in more detail. Uh, we're in great shape out of the pad. We've used up our four days of contingency for that leak repair, but we're right on schedule now. We'll get into our ordnance installation tonight, which we had to delay because of the work in the after the orbiter. Uh, we'll do the, uh, the main propulsion system and hypergolic, hypergolic systems pressurizations on Thursday night. And throughout this week, we'll be closing out the after the orbiter. That's in work right now. And I see no reason right now at all that uh, we can't get into a launch countdown per plan on Friday afternoon at 2.30. Uh, and uh, leading up to the opening of the launch window at 16.35 next Monday the 1st with a preferred time of about 16.40 or so. And, of course, that will be adjusted uh, real time on launch day. Um, 
about a week or 10 days or so ago, I, I wouldn't have been quite as positive about launch countdown. Uh, we picked up the leak. We weren't sure where it was at first. Um, guys walking by the orbiter uh, smelled a little, a little fuel, and that started the investigation. And so we got into the aft, and, and we ultimately found the leak at, the flange, uh, at, at a flange joint in the aft um, between the two pods. And, um, and, and we made the decision, Mike made the decision to go ahead and change out the seals and that guy. It was, it was a very, very small leak, but nevertheless, we weren't quite sure what was causing the leak. And so the, the better course of valor was to go ahead and change out those seals. It was a very, very tough job. And, and if we have that video, I'd like to roll that right now and, and we can talk your way through it a little bit. This is a view from inside the aft. Uh, you'll see here shortly a, a technician in a scape suit right in the middle of the picture there. Uh, the work was, uh, was above her head, um, the visibility was limited, the access was limited, reaching over her head to do the work was very, very tough, um, but, but our technicians really came through in, in uh, flying colors. It was an outstanding job. You can see how tight the, the access is. A lot of it was by feel. Um, you can see other folks helping out with flashlights, et cetera. But we were able to, uh, to get the flange apart, replace the seals, and we've passed all of our leak checks since then. We will send those seals off to the, to the malfunction lab to take a good microscopic look at the seals to see if there are any uh, little surface defects on them. Uh, first blush, um, when the seals came out, they looked okay. The sealing surfaces looked okay. So right now I can't report a, a smoking gun per se, but we'll take a good, uh, good hard look at those seals. Probably a case of uh, transient contamination, not quite sure yet. Don't want to jump to that conclusion, but that um, has been a, a, an issue in the past, so likely that's, that's what it was. Again, we've got that system all buttoned back up. We got reloaded. We had to drain all that fuel in order to open up that cross-feed line, of course, and uh, got that all loaded back up over the weekend. We're in, we're in outstanding shape out the pad. Um, we've done all of our training. We did extra training over the summer to make sure that the launch team and, and flight control teams were up to speed and, and, and ready for this mission. Did actually did quite a bit of extra training in the downtime this summer. So I feel good about the team. I feel good about uh, getting to launch countdown on Friday and having a liftoff on the first attempt next Monday. Thanks. All right, thank you. We'll take questions. Uh, please wait for the microphone and please state your name and affiliation. We'll start off with Marsha Dunn. Um, Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. I'm wondering, did Discovery, this being Discovery's last flight, did that even make mention during today's meeting? Was there a, you know, a moment of reflection among the teams? And is there any special commemoration type things that will be packed aboard to make the special trip? Let's see, at, at, um, <clears throat> at the FR today, we didn't even mention that this was the last flight, um, and so we didn't talk about it. Um, they are, uh, we are flying some uh, a flight kit for some end of mission patches. We've been kind of doing that now, uh, some, some mementos that we stash away in some of the little tiny compartments behind the, the lockers. Um, I know the crew is probably going to plan a little uh, commemorative event down Lincoln uh, when they're up in space. I don't know the details of it. So, again, kind of you're going to hear the theme from the from the, the program, from the astronauts, and, and from probably the administration the same way, that uh, we're still looking forward. I think you heard John Shannon say it the other day that he doesn't like to look in the rearview mirror, right? So even though this orbiter is going to be done, we still have a couple more missions to go in front of us. We don't want to lose the focus. So um, we'll probably do something, but it'll stay low-key uh, until we're all done. And I'll, I'll just tell you, Marsha, that in the control room we have a little surprise plan, but uh, it's a surprise for the launch team, so if I were to tell you, then they'd know, and I'm, so I'm not going to tell you. Is that for after lunch? Yeah. After lunch, okay. Uh, Jim Siegel, the Celebration Independent newspaper. I wanted to ask you about the seals that were replaced. Uh, is that the kind of thing that's replaced periodically, or has it been in there since the, since the very beginning when, when uh, Discovery was launched, uh, and so on? Well, let's see. They're replaced whenever we take the pod off, I believe. Yeah. And, and it, it's the system that connects both pods together on the fuel side. And so whenever we take one pod off or both, we have to break that joint in order to... Uh, in order to, to uh, and we took, this, we took this pod off for this flow, I believe, to, right. to do some work in the pod, some helium right. isolation valves. Right. So this interface was broken, this flow, and it was leak checked and verified prior to rolling out to the pad and then the leak showed up out at the pad. So this, this particular interface was broken, this flow, and then, then remade it. Right. Okay, um, we have a question from Bill Harwood. Bill Harwood, CBS, and I live in Florida, and I know this is a dumb question, but I'll ask it anyway, which is, have you heard a long-range forecast uh, for the weekend or Monday? Um, gosh, I, didn't, I missed the morning forecast this morning. I, it's been so dry lately, I just hope it stays that way. Um, I, I, I really don't have that for you. 
Um, Todd Halverson, uh, Florida Today, I think for uh, Gerst, um, with the shuttle program winding down and um, the uh, direction the agency is headed toward uh, commercial crew and cargo, I'm wondering if you could tell us um, how you feel about where the commercial cargo guys are in terms of their ability to come on in a timely manner and start delivering cargo to the International Space Station and how you feel about uh, the, the progress that's being made on the commercial crew side. I think on the cargo side, uh, you know, SpaceX was, has just announced uh, no earlier than launch date of the 18th of uh, November. So this is their C-1 or their first demonstration flight that they will fly and they'll do, I think, two orbits and then do a reentry of their capsule after that, uh, that mission. I think that'll be a good test to see how things are going in their systems, and then we can talk more specifically after we see how their flight goes. Uh, you know, they're asking a lot to, to get done in that flight. You know, it seems simple to just describe two orbits and then a reentry. That's still a pretty sophisticated test for them. They have their whole attitude control system on orbit, which hasn't been checked out yet. They'll do some maneuvers with that. They have their entry systems with the parachute system, the heat shield, all that performance to come back, as well as a water recovery off the coast of California. So they have a, a pretty aggressive first flight, and, and we'll see how all that goes. They're, they're taking their time working through the, the issues that they've got with their vehicle. They're discovering the things that, that we find all the time. They had some software things they wanted to spend a little more time working with. They have some hardware integration tests where they check out their hardware with their software. They wanted some additional time to do that, so that's why they moved from the 8th to the 18th. So they're doing all the right things. They've got the right, um, the right attitude of, of how to get ready for flight. Uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how this flight goes and, and see what they do here with the, with the November flight. And then they have potentially two more demonstration flights before they actually, the third one will actually come to space station. Uh, again, we're flying their Dragon Eye, which is their rendezvous prox op sensor to station, which will give them some key data to see how that device performs on the shuttle. That will be very important for them to do some closed-loop simulations with their uh, attitude control system to make sure things work well. So they're doing everything right. Um, we'll see as far as schedule goes. We'll protect a little bit as much as we can. That's why we would like the additional shuttle flight if we can get it in the the spring of next year, we'd like to have some more margin to get some critical cargo up so if they're not quite on time and they're delayed by a couple months, it's not an impact to station. We don't have to do anything dramatic. So, again, I think we're doing prudent planning to try to get as much cargo prepositioned and be ready to support them in case their schedule slips a little bit. I wouldn't be surprised if their schedule doesn't slip a little bit. They're asking, they have a lot of challenges to go through, but so far they're doing all the right things. They're moving forward. They're, they're treating it with the right respect. And on the crew side, I'm not as familiar with the crew side. I'm pretty focused on the cargo piece right now, and, and, and we're just kind of still in the formulation phase, more on the crew side. Um, could, do you have a time frame in which you might envision if these guys don't come along in a timely enough manner, w could there be a situation developed that you would actually have to go back to three crew from six? And if so, at what point would, would you envision that happening? It, it again it's kind of a function of what happens on orbit you know if we don't have a lot of failures and, and things work pretty well and we get the additional flight we can probably run all the way till 2012 or so before we would have to take some kind of action if we don't get the additional flight then that's sometime in 2011 so uh, excuse me yeah sometime in earlier 2012 so we can probably go almost all the way to 2013 uh, with the normal schedules uh, if if we get the additional shuttle flight and, and with the additional shuttle flight, uh, could you talk about what benefits you might get out of actually flying that later in the year rather than earlier in the year, rather than June, a little bit later in the year? I think the advantage is there's some components that the station guys are, are working on. Uh, there's an advanced... Uh, uh, I don't know. It's a, an advanced uh, brine tank, essentially, that, that stores the... Uh, the, the, the brine from the urine processor, uh, they would like to fly that. That's available probably about a month or two after the June flight. 
that would be nice to fly that up. Again, we can fly it on commercial cargo, we can fly it on ATV, or we can fly it on HTV, but it would be nice to, to get it on a shuttle in that time frame. So I think the advantage of a little bit later is it allows us to pick up some components that are being manufactured for station that would then fall into a subsequent flight later. But we've got a pretty good overall manifest with the progress flights, with the automated transfer vehicle flights, and with the Japanese HTV flights that, you know, it, it fits well. We've got plenty of opportunities to go fly. In fact, I think there's 17 flights to space station next year, and that includes a shuttle flight. So it's a pretty dynamic uh, time time frame coming to station in the years in the future. So, you know, we lose the shuttle with all its up mass carrying capability, but we replace that with a lot of smaller vehicles, which means more flights. So then that gives us more opportunities to fly things, and, and we can we can juggle that out. So again, I think the big advantage of the of the flight is it allows us to get some things up to station. It also allows us to return some things from station, so we can get a chance to see what's uh, what's failed and what, what doesn't work. We'd like to get the ammonia pump back that recently failed. That would be on STS-135. We would like to return that ammonia pump to better understand the failure mode. Um, we're getting hydrogen dome back on this flight. As Mike said, that's really important to us to understand what's going on in our oxygen generation system. And so the shuttle gives us tremendous capability to get a lot of down mass back. And Dragon will too, but it won't give us quite as much as the shuttle does. Let's take one more here before we uh, go to the phone bridge. Irene Klotz with Reuters um, for Mr. Gerstenmeier. Um, have, has uh, NASA um, started um, or do you expect to get started at all in your department on any information or studies or anything related to space technology or space flight with China stemming from um, General Bolden's uh, recent visit there beyond the Earth sciences that are already kind of well underway? Yeah, I don't envision anything really other than probably the earth science kind of things that, that are sitting out there. We, we have recently uh, released an international docking standard out on the web, and that's available for anybody to take a look at any country and provide us comments back. There's actually a comment section. Uh, again, we didn't specify a docking design but we specified an interface that if you can meet this interface, you could potentially dock to space station in the future. This document was signed by the, uh, the four uh, partner countries of space station. So we think that this is the standard that we want to put out there in the future. So we put that out for folks to take a look at. And, and we're hoping that some, some countries that are thinking about space flight in the future or are doing space flight now would give us some comments to that standard. We'll do another update in the April time frame, so it would be important to get some comments to that to, to see where it is. But again, it doesn't specify a design. It just specifies a basic interface. You know, kind of like if you think of it like a USB port, you, the, you know, any device can, they can interface with that then can be used in that location. So it's the same thing. We could then have interchangeability between docking and systems in the future. And, and so that's out there. But I don't envision anything really from the, from the China trip probably other than the science kind of things that are kind of already underway. And the other question I wanted to ask you about is the um, the bill that the Senate passed that the House approved at their last day of uh, work before breaking for the recess. Um, has NASA started uh, kind of parsing through that to see your, I think you're required to um, come up with quite a lot of reports in the next uh, 60 to 90 days. Can you maybe give us some kind of summary of what work is on the table and where that stands. Thanks. Yeah, we actually, I think there for us, there may be on the order of uh, maybe 20 or 30 reports that are due during a varying time frame. And you know, they have certain days after bill signing. So the clock started ticking once the bill was signed. We have detailed plans for each one of those reports. Um, we have kind of a since we're in space ops, we have this problem where we timeline everything. So everything is timelined out. We need to provide these reports to OMB to be reviewed by a certain time frame. They need to go to certain offices at headquarters to be reviewed by a certain time frame. So we have all those many milestones of when our reports have to be done at this stage, handed off to who. They get X number of weeks to review. We get it back. We make the mods, pass it off to the next office to meet the congressional due date at the end. So. We have gone through all those reports. They're all timeline on an Excel spreadsheet. We have the critical path through all those reports, and we're ready to deliver those to Congress when, when they needed them. So we've, we've done all that work, and we're ready to go execute. And it's not very much different than last year. We had the same thing in the previous year's authorization bill and the year before. So this is pretty much normal business for us each year. Um, some of the reports will be pretty, uh, pretty long and pretty arduous for us, and we've actually started working on some of them now. 
Okay, on the uh, phone bridge, I believe we have Denise Chow from Space.com. Denise? ...made to uh, Discovery Seal Lines. Um, first, the replacement of the seals on the seal lines. Just wondering if that specific problem has been encountered before prior to launch on any previous missions. And then also was just wondering how long the repairs took. Well, see, this particular problem has not been encountered before. It was new to us. Um, the repair itself took... Uh, about four days total, we had to drain the system of its fuel before we could break into it and, and, and open the joint and get the seals out. That was about a day's worth of work. And there was a lot of preparations leading up to this, but the actual work itself took about, about three and a half days. We drained the fuel. We had to uh, what's called educt. We had to educt the system to get the residual fuel out of, the, out of it so that we could uh, go in there in, in uh, relative safety with our scape suits, do the work on the seals, and then uh, button it back up and reload. And that, that was all about a three and a half day job. Um, it's not unusual to see seals in a, in a liquid system that has uh, transient contamination or, or very, very, very small nicks to them. Don't know what the case is yet. We'll get that information for you. But uh, we were sure we could do the work. It was the access to it was going to be the issue. And we got around that. We built some special platforms in the aft to, get, to give the technicians better access to that very, very cramped area that you saw on TV. Uh, so the work itself was, was understood, a little bit different um, location for us, but the guys really came through in flying colors. Any uh, other questions, Denise? Um, no, thank you. Okay, thank you. Back here, uh, Marcia Dunn. Associated Press for Bill. Um, two timeline questions. What's the latest you could envision flying the extra flight, um, all things being equal? There are been some rumors going around even November and that seems pretty late but you know best and and when do you expect to start deciding which museums are getting all three shuttles on the uh, when's the, the latest we could fly I think again we're probably limited budget wise is is probably the constraint of, of what's going to limit us I think right now we, we still want to stay planning for the June flight. That's what our budget submit is based on. That's what our contingency are. That's, that's a good time for us to fly. It's a good compromise time. If something allows us to move it a little bit later and there's a piece of hardware that adds tremendous advantage to us, like I was describing earlier, then we might push it a couple months or a couple weeks. But I don't think you'll see a big wholesale move of it. There's not anything that, that, would, that would really be advantageous to move that far. So I think we'll be around the June time frame. And, and maybe we'd like a little margin to move that a little bit to the right if we find a component that if we could wait a week or two, we could get another component to station. That might be advantageous to us. So I don't think you'll see a big big wholesale move in, in that area. And the, the museum date, I don't know the, the timeline for that yet. We're still kind of focused, as, as Mike and John say, on flying, and we haven't really, I haven't worked with the uh, folks yet to, to figure out when that release is going to be. But. I don't. I don't know when we'll we'll make make that announcement. And, and then there's one other thing that I I, I forgot it came up late in our review is there's a potential conjunction conjunction with space station that you may hear about. It may require us to do a maneuver tomorrow morning. So you may hear the teams talking about that uh, over over the evening. It's uh, it's a tough thing to plan because we've got the progress coming up to dock on Saturday and then we've got the shuttle docking uh, next week. So we've got to really find a maneuver that clears the conjunction but doesn't impact either the progress docking or the shuttle docking. So it's kind of a, a fine line to walk for the teams. I'll continue to, to track. We did do the progress undock today, which you heard. So we did a maneuver to and from the undock attitude. Sometimes just that maneuver to and from the attitude is enough to perturb the orbit of the station that it may have cleared the conjunction and it may go away. But, but I think tomorrow morning there, there's potentially a, a chance that there'll be a small maneuver on board space station to avoid, uh, uh, I think it's a spent rocket body. And, and you'll hear those, those details probably talked about on the loops if you're, if you're listening to the loops. Uh, Jim Siegel, Celebration Independent Newspaper. Uh, regarding the uh, shuttle or the orbiter when it returns, uh, it's going to be readied for the Smithsonian, I suppose. Can you describe some of the things that are going to be done to the orbiter to get it ready for that for that journey? And is it going to go on? Uh, how is it going to travel on the on the back of the 70, 747, uh, or how is that going to work? No, I, I we could go over some of the some of those details with you, but I, I think it would be worthwhile for you all to, to see the 
the transition and retirement schedule and all the plans and, and the work that has to go into to safety orbiter and get it ready for transportation and actually get it to its ultimate destination. I wouldn't I don't think it, I don't think we'd do it justice by going over just a couple three things today that would that uh, need to be done. It, it it's a huge effort. And and all three orbits are all they're all played together to retire and, and use the crews wisely um, to, to schedule all the work between the three orbiters. It's, it's a heck of a lot of work. And we want to keep this orbiter essentially as a backup mm -hmm. if it's needed for any testing or any parts for the other orbiters. So the down processing, you know, once we land on the runway, the basic safing, the basic down processing is very similar to any orbiter that returns. Those first steps that we do, the, the purges, the safing, those things will all be done just as it's a flight vehicle. We want to keep it in a flight configuration initially so it can be used for spare parts or used as a test facility to go take a look at. If we have a problem on one of the other orbiters and we'd like to go look, say, at a you know, a line installation or look at a flange, we can go to Discovery and, and not worry about it having to go fly, but we can actually go in and do some investigation to help us with the other orbiters. So we're going to keep it pretty much in a flight configuration, and then we start the more detailed processing that, that Mike is describing, and he needs to, and it would be good for him to go through all the details of what it takes to actually start preparing it. But it's a, it's a multiple-month activity. Yeah, fair enough. And uh, quickly, um, what about what percentage of the uh, cargo is consumables on this flight like food for example and where where is that on where is that contained in in the modules i think a lot of the stuff is in the uh, permanent uh, mplm and i don't know the percentage of food and hardware there's an express right there's quite a bit of other hardware and and See if we can find a. Yeah, I don't have that. Uh, I don't we have it we handy. don't have it handy, but it, it's fairly small because we're going to use the progress vehicle with quite a bit of food that's coming up. The one that's going to dock it it carries a, a substantial amount of food for us. Then we have an eight an HTV scheduled in January and an ATV scheduled in February, and both of those will also carry a significant amount of food. So. So we tried to put on the shuttle unique things that were associated with the shuttle that were, couldn't be carried easily by any other vehicle. So there'll be things like the scientific experiments, the Robonaut, the uh, express rack, um, some systems, some other components, the radiator that goes on the outside, those things. So they're kind of unique things that, that are best carried by the shuttle. Okay, we have uh, questions from Bill, Irene, and Todd. Bill Harwood again. Um, for Gers, as long as we got you, how, is there an update on 134? How's AMS doing? Are they, are they holding good to the end of February? Yeah, I think AMS is holding pretty good. You'll hear them talk about uh, they have a power distribution system, some circuit boards, that they have seen some testing of some components that were not uh, soldered uh, very as good as we would like to some of the boards, some uh, MOSFET transistors and some diodes. So I think they're going to change some of those boards out over the next couple of weeks, so they will do that. That still all supports the uh, the flow at the end of February, but but you'll hear them, and then we have to do some uh, regression testing after we get those boards reinstalled. So we're going to take them. I think there's 22 boards. We're going to take them out in two steps. There'll be 11 that are that are coming out right now after the testing's been completed, and all that testing went very well with the AMS. It looks looks very good. And then uh, on November 18th, we'll do a go no go to remove the second set of 11 boards and, and pull those out. And that work will be completed by January, and then that should pour up should should support upload to the canister and be ready to go for the 27th February launch. So AMS looks looks really really good. And I have a detailed briefing tomorrow with the AMS team where they're going to sit down and go over with me all their the the results they've had and so far with the testing here at the Cape. But it's been extremely good. Uh, minor little software things that we found some incompatibility things, but that's exactly why we test, to get those fixed so they're not surprises once we get on orbit. So it's going very well. Irene? Irene Klotz with Reuters. Um, Bill, if it turns out that, um, that the government is funded under um, another continuing resolution after December 2nd instead of like an omnibus spending bill, um, would NASA be free to fly the 135 flight? I don't know. I, I, I don't. We need to go. I, we'd have to go look at the spend rate, the fund rates, and then we'd have to go look and see where we are with the authorization language and, and other things. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Okay. 
And I guess just following that for a minute, if um, if that did happen, obviously the shuttle budget in fiscal year 10 is more than what NASA had requested or the White House requested in fiscal year 11. So what would you use? How like how does that work? If you can't start new programs, but your old programs are funded at higher levels, what do you do? Yeah, the the problem, the reason I couldn't answer the previous question is the the problem is it depends how long the continuing resolution lasts. So we're funded at the FY10 enacted levels, but then as soon as the actual budget is approved, we are now running at the new FY11 budget. So if I spent all the money in the first part of the year, right, at the higher levels, and then I get this new 11 budget, then I've got to actually save more money than actually run lower in that remaining couple months of 11. And that could be a dramatic cut to us. So then, you know, I've got a lot of money, and then all of a sudden I got like no money, or actually less than I would have had at normal 11 levels. So, so it becomes problematic, and I don't know how long that second continuing resolution period is going to run. What what my options are? So we'd probably have to consult with some congressional folks and some budget folks and, and decide what the what the right mix is. Todd. Todd Halperson of Florida Today. I think for uh, Mike Moses um, could. You guys talked about how much traffic is coming up uh, in, in recent weeks uh, or coming weeks uh, at the space station. Um, just for informational purposes, because I know you're not going to get here, but what would be your next opportunity after the upcoming beta angle cutout in November to actually fly uh, this mission? I think there's a Soyuz coming back at the end of November, another one going up. I think there's a progress. In a lot of traffic. Could you give us an idea of what available windows there are beyond the one you're coming up to? Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, and like you said, a, a lot of it's dependent on on visiting vehicles. Some of it, there are two big cutouts for beta angle, which is the the, the angle the sun makes on the the station when the shuttle's docked. Um, we violate some shuttle thermal constraints if we stay docked to the station. Uh, normally, the shuttle would, if it was by itself, just maneuver and and uh, and shade some of those components so they wouldn't get overheated. So there's a big beta angle coming out that starts November 8th, and that takes us through just about the end of November. Uh, and then there's a little window that opens up right for about three or five, three to five days at the beginning of December. Um, the problem is threading that window right now, there's a Soyuz launch in there that, that may move a, a, a couple of days. If that moves, that would probably help. If it doesn't, um, that window would be a, a period where the station has a three-man crew. And a lot of the science we're taking up, we call sortie science, which is science taken up. Uh, the station crew either comes over, does it on the shuttle, we take it over, do it on the station, and then it returns on this mission as well. Uh, and so if we flew that with only a three-person crew, we wouldn't get to a lot of that. I don't know the details of how much we'd lose or how we'd resequence, but as a, as a generic preference, all things being equal, we'd prefer not to use that as a launch window. If that became the only chance we had to launch, then we might have a different answer. So until it's actually here in front of us, our, our preference is to skip that little bit of window at the beginning of December. And then we take another big beta cutout that goes uh, to the end of the year. Uh, and then there's an ATV and an HTV that we don't want to be dual docked operations while they're there and docking and undocking. And so that takes us all the way to the February 27th window. So rough order of magnitude, we have a, a little slice in the beginning of December, and then we'd be looking at the end of February in the 134 slot right now. Uh, now, that's all not renegotiating anything else. The Russian launches could move, the ATV launch can move, the, the, the ATV launches can be moved. So it all depends on why we slipped and, and what the, the resulting priorities for the agency are. And I think that's, that's the danger in speculating because right. once we move and we know why we moved, we'll start negotiating with whoever we can negotiate to fly when the right time is to go fly. So this is one of those things we'll tell you today what all the constraints are. <laughs> and then tomorrow you'll look at us with cross-eyed and you'll go, wait a minute, you said you had all these constraints. But we'll, we'll move all those constraints when the, <laughs> when the time comes that we have to. Okay. And just so I can understand in January there's the big beta angle cut out and then it's the ATV after that beta a angle cut out HTV HTV first yeah. HTV then f 15th of February is ATV okay thanks and for Mike Leinbach um, uh, the other Mike talked about this a little bit but uh, you've been around discovery for darn near a quarter century and I'm <laughs> I'm wondering what it feels like to you to have this uh, fleet leader making its final flight. Hmm. I, th I think the words you hear in, in the halls at KSC and probably every other center is that it's, it's still kind of hard to believe. Um, 
it has been around forever. People that are, that are uh, under 30 years old have always seen America fly the space shuttle. So it, it's been part of our part of our uh, history, part of the American culture, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be different without flying the shuttle. This this particular orbiter um, has has served us extremely well. It is the fleet leader. It's going to be hard to see her retire. Um, but we need to do what we need to do for the agency, and, and so we'll get on with uh, our final flight. We'll make it the best one ever. One last uh, question from Irene. Thanks. So from the old to the new, um, why this press conference is going on, I guess NASA released the solicitation for the CC Dev Part 2. Um, can you maybe just generally talk about what you'd like to get out of the second part of the program, if it's sort of more advanced technologies of what's already been funded, or are you looking for new partners? And just to, sorry for another budget question, but it looked like it was $200 million in fiscal year $11, although that's not a new start. So would you plan on going ahead and actually proceeding with that program, no matter what your funding style is for the year? Thanks. Yeah. And I, oh, I think the the best answer for you is to actually read the proposal itself. We, it's not that tough to read, and, and you can you can see what we're looking for in the proposal itself. It's pretty self-evident of what we're doing, and you can you can read that. And and then the other thing is in terms of the funding, we think we can get the funding authority to go do this, even if we ended up in some kind of continuing resolution. But we'll sort through all that along with all the other budget discussions we just had if if we end up there. Do you have any Do you have any idea when these awards might be made? I guess you're things are due December 13th? I, I don't know. if it, You'd have to, again, I, I don't have the final copy. I, the re, I'm not avoiding your question. I haven't read the final version. I read a preliminary version, and I don't want to say what I read in the preliminary version and then have the final version say something else because it's really done by the Exploration Systems Mission Directorate. So it's better you read it, but I think it'll call out in there when we anticipate uh, tentative awards in the, in the proposal itself. Okay. With that, we will end today's briefing. Our next STS-133 televised event will be the arrival of Commander Steve Lindsay and his crew here at Kennedy Space Center on Thursday. The countdown will pick up with call to stations at 2.30 in the afternoon on Friday, and the countdown begins at 3 o'clock. Uh, and then we're headed towards launch a week from today at uh, just about this time, 4.40 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Thank you all for coming.